Hello, hello, JJ DeGeronimo here, and I am loving the start of this new year. So many amazing lightworkers are coming forward and sharing their work in new ways. Some of us are consolidating, some of us are embracing what is coming to us, and some of us are enhancing our own journey. And Catherine Llewellyn is no different. I am thrilled to have her here today to talk about so many of the things that she used to be doing. Now, what is she working towards and how is she helping us really get to our own evolution? So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, so many places to start, but I think I just want to start at a high level. You have evolved your business into the being space. So what does that mean to you? And what does that mean to people that come to you? Well, I I believe that the very, very first thing that we need, if we want to have a good life or transform, is a space to be exactly who we are and how we are in any given moment. And in our world, particularly in the Western world, we put so much energy into being somebody else or being different or being better. And the trouble with that is it disempowers us because it cuts us off from the root of our truth. So I'm looking to provide spaces for people to be exactly as they are and to really connect with that, integrate with that. And from that place, then they naturally tend to transform because we all do. When we have that space, transformation is not only possible, it's almost inevitable. I love that. I love that. And I think it's just such a beautiful place to be right now because so many people are just sort of sick of everything they've been carrying. And the beauty of just allowing us to be as we are is really refreshing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I love it. And I love watching how people transform in the space. It's just, you know, incredible. Well, with all your work uh, over the last few decades, I mean, you're so passionate about the transformation of humans and the evolution. Like, where did that come from? And how do you feel like you got on that path? I I, I was thinking about that question before we came on. And um, I think there was a transition that occurred when I undertook an enlightenment intensive long weekend in the late 1970s. And this was called exegesis. And it was a kind of British equivalent of EST, which has now evolved into uh, the Landmark Forum. So um, in, in the beginning, it was EST. And before that, there was Mind Dynamics. And in amongst there, there was exegesis, which was UK based or exegesis. And I think that's the first time that I sort of clicked onto this idea of I'm actually part of a global community in terms of our consciousness and our evolving. And there's something there that I really find appealing. I think before that, because when I did that, I was in my early 20s. And before that, I was much more self-obsessed, you know, much more, how do I grow? How do I become more happy, capable, loved, loving, enlightened, creative, you know? And I think that, That weekend was the first time that I really connected in with that much more collective insight. I mean, I was there, I think there were 80 of us on that weekend. And and I was witnessing people going through the most extraordinary shifts and, you know, difficult meltdowns and all sorts of things across the weekend. And, And it really steeped in me how profoundly thrilling it is when someone shifts in front of you you know, that courage and that generosity where someone is willing to do that. And then when I went through my shifts, they were holding me, these other people. You know, I was held in that space. And I thought there's something incredible here in the collective. So I think that's probably where that shift occurred. But it wouldn't have happened like that if it wasn't for the years before that. I was introduced very, very young to the idea of Uh, We can be who we want to be. We can think for ourselves. It doesn't matter if we're a man or a woman or a child or an adult. You know, we've all got that opportunity and that responsibility. So 
in a kind of indiv individualistic way, I was very connected. But then on that weekend, I flipped over into, ah, there's something much bigger and more important here than just me. I love that. And I love the journey. I love the fact that we choose how we come onto the planet and the fact that you were awakened or introduced to the fact that that is possible at such an early age is amazing in itself. And mm -hmm. so what made you sign up for that? Because I always love like, what is the kind of tipping point or the catalyst that made you sign up for that particular weekend? It's a slightly embarrassing story, actually. Uh, what happened, I, was, I was living in Oxford in England, which is a beautiful city. And I was just hanging out, basically. I was on the dole, it was called, every week or whatever. It's like a social yeah. security thing. Um, and I was just hanging out doing that and partying, having a great time, but not doing nothing with my life. And some friends of mine who were doing the same thing disappeared for a weekend. No one knew where they'd gone. They came back and they were completely different. They were uh, coming up with projects and doing really bold things and being really creative. And they were really happy. They were like glowing. And so I said, what have you done? They said, we've done this weekend. I said, great. They said, uh, you might enjoy it. I said, no, 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 no. I can do it by myself, I said. <laughs> ego, hashtag ego, right? So I said, I can do it myself. And so they would sit with me late into the night, talking with me, trying to persuade me. And after about three months, I suddenly noticed they'd got fed up and they'd stopped talking to me about it. They'd always, I found out later they'd had a chat between each other and said, Catherine is just being absolutely a stubborn nuisance, a nightmare riser. Everybody stop talking to her about this. Just leave it and leave her in her own ego-driven, you know, insanity. And I, I waited for a few weeks and they never came back to talk about it. And so I went, oh, no, I have not transformed myself in the last three months. I'm going to have to go. So I rang up the organization secretly, booked a place, didn't tell anybody, <laughs> you know, because I'd, I'd been faced with the fact that, that, that they'd actually got some assistance with this and it was transformative and I could not do that by myself. I just couldn't. Mm. And I secretly um, went and booked myself on it. <laughs> I love that. I love that for so many reasons, right? Because one, the first thing that comes to me is their frequency was shifting. Their energy was shifting. They were moving away from you because they were more, they were like learning, leaning into their journey. So that's one, they changed, they were able to change their energy Two, They were a guide for you because mm. they or ushering you down your path. You can't make people do things, but helping them, sort of ushering them down what is possible, I call guides. So to me, they were a guide for you. And the fact that you just like ended up with them at a time where they were doing that is a miracle in itself. And so yeah, it was the yeah. universe ushering you along through the people that you knew. And honestly, people that are on unemployment or social security, they may or may not explore another way of living. But the fact that you were with a group that did do that is, is is quite a miracle. Yeah, I know. I'm very grateful to those people for that happening. I um, love that. I love that. And I think it really touches on the obstacle so many put in front of ourselves in our own evolution and journey is that we often think like, oh, I can figure it out. I can get there. I don't need to sign up for this class. I'm fine. But in reality, there's a lot of momentum that happens in these group settings, especially if you have the right teachers. Yeah, totally. I mean, the guy who ran that particular weekend, I mean, this guy was a tiger. You know, he was a, a machine. You know, he was up there talking to this massive group and dealing with the most ridiculous nonsense people were coming up with and helping people crack through their limitations. And he he was like doing it. 15, 20 hours, no, no, 15 hours a day for three days, nonstop. I ha yeah, I, no one understands how he was able to do it, but he was absolutely crystal clear mirror to everybody. Absolutely brilliant. I was so impressed. And in fact, when I saw him, the minute I heard him start to speak, something in me knew I want to do something like that. I want to be somebody who can facilitate shifts like this for people. Because that suddenly that was the best game in town. Suddenly, oh my God, this is just... Because people came, you know, we, we had a thing where you'd come back three days later for an evening and you'd report back on what's happened in your life 
in a three day period. <laughs> and people, were, you know, they transformed their relationships. They'd left their job. They'd got another job. They'd lost weight. They'd had their hair. You know, they'd, they'd made all sorts of significant shifts in three days. And then they carry on and there were follow up courses you can do and so on and so forth. And people were just absolutely changing their lives. And I thought, you know what, a shift that happens internally for us affects everything in our lives, everything. So why would I want to do anything else? This is like so much I talk about in my book, Seeking, like you saw a glimpse of your life's work right there at that event. And like, you weren't meant to be with the other teacher. You weren't meant to go three months earlier. Otherwise you would have gone with your friends. The fact that you had to simmer on it and then cultivate the ask yourself, make the phone call, you know, book a place, which back then was not easy to do from afar. So, I mean, just, it is a great representation of how the universe will usher you along if you'll lean into the invitations. Yeah, you're so right. Even if you fight against the invitation to begin with, which I did. But the mm. fact I was fighting so hard was actually a measure of why I needed to do it. Mm. Isn't you that know? the truth? Yeah. Right? Our ego's like, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah. You're fine. As is. <laughs> so I want to dive more into some of the obstacles and the value of your work and some of the things you're doing. But the one thing that really caught my attention when I was working with you a few months ago is Pillowa. Like, mm. what is that? You're a teacher of this. Please help me like break it down for people that have never heard of it, including me. Yeah. Well, so obviously I was really into the whole thing about shifting our consciousness, you know, through my mentoring work and running groups and doing, you know, Reiki and stuff like that. And um, a really good friend who I hadn't seen for 15 years because she'd been back home in Australia, came back to the UK and a mutual friend arranged a lunch. The three of us had lunch. And so I turned to my friend and said, hi, Julie, what have you been doing for the last 15 years in Australia? And she said, Pelua. I said, oh, that's interesting. What is that? She said, it's about radical shift in consciousness. I said, I want to do it. How do I do that? She said, well, there's a two-day workshop. So I turned to my other friend, who by this time I realized this was a fix up. She'd set this up intentionally for this to happen. And she said, should we, uh, should we do it? I said, yeah. And we said, will you do a workshop for the two of us? Yep. A week later, I was on the workshop. So that's an example of just that word, Pelua. Some people hear it and they go, where do I sign up? It's like a magical word. It means radical shift in consciousness. So I then became a practitioner, and then a few years later, I did the teacher training. And essentially, this is a, it's an energy technique. It comes direct from source. It's a very, very fine, high energy, much more so than, say, the Reiki energy, which is much more dense physical energy. And it, when you are a practitioner, what you do is you call in the Pelua energy and then you hold the sacred space for that. But you don't intervene. You don't interfere because what happens is the Pelua actually engages with the consciousness of the client. And a contract is created in that engagement, which is designed to create the shift that that person requires for their highest potential. So that's at a much deeper level than anything I, as an individual human being, would be able to actually comprehend or engage with. So I'm there holding the space, not really knowing what's happening for my client, right? And they're experiencing whatever they're experiencing. And when they come out, by the way, it's a hands-off treatment. So I pretty much always do it now, uh, distant. So I've got you know people in Australia, the US, anywhere. People receive it when they're asleep, when they're awake, it doesn't matter. And when they come out of it, as a practitioner, I don't get to interpret their experience for them. I don't get to give them my fabulous wisdom. I don't get to say to them, oh, I saw some golden light around your heart when I was giving you the treatment. No, because it's their journey and their experience. So as a teacher, I now have the privilege of holding these weekend workshops where I can actually attune somebody so that they can now 
hold the Pelawa for somebody and facilitate Pelawa for somebody. And what, what they've also done, because they've done both attunements, level one allows you to facilitate Pelawa, level two is for you personally, which is that expands your capacity to hold the light and it increases and deepens your connection with your higher self. So that then means that everything in your life is shifted exponentially from that point on. So I could talk forever about Pelawa, but that that's the essential bare bones of it. I love it. I love the word. I love the word. Like when I, as soon as I saw it and started pronouncing it, I was like, that is a beautiful, it reminds me of a pillow. Like it just engulfs yeah. you. I know. I just love it. I love it. So, you know, as we round this up, I, you know, your work of helping people transform into the light creates space for why they are here and not carry the energy that so many put on us of what we should be doing is such a beautiful process. Yeah. Why do you think so many humans resist moving into this way of living? Well, resistance is a self-protective mechanism. So the degree to which we need to self-protect ourselves is a combination of many, many factors. So it can be our conditioning that we've been trained to be wary of certain things. It may be that we've been wounded and we're frightened of being wounded further. It may be that we've had money problems and we're frightened of losing money, wasting money. I had someone call me the other day and say, I'm really attracted to this Pelawa thing. You know, she said, she said, look, I'm a lawyer. So I think in straight lines, I think rationally, but I'm trying to understand what this Pelawa thing is. And I'm I, what I'm really worried about is spending money and doing something that will do nothing for me. That's what I'm worried about. I said, I completely understand that. And I cannot prove to you that you will get something from it. And she said, thank you for that. I'm in. That's all she needed. She just needed to be held in her resistance mm. and allowed to have her resistance. And then her heart went, yeah, and I'm going to do it. So resistance is there for so many reasons. In fact, I just recently recorded an episode about resistance myself on my podcast because it's such a powerful learning place for us. It's the number of times I've been working with a client, right, and we're doing something and and they're resisting doing it, resisting doing it. And I said, great, let's put that on one side. Let's talk about this resistance. What are the feelings in your body? What are the thoughts in your mind? What are the patterns? What are the imaginations? Let's discuss the resistance. What's the shape and the color of it and the vibration of it and the texture? And the shifts that occur just by looking at our resistance are phenomenal. That is gorgeous because honestly, how often do people talk to you about your resistance when ask you to describe it with color? Because as soon as you start to sort of just let it open up and even put a color to it or a feeling, you, you can almost drum up what is holding you back, even if it's from decades ago. Yeah. And as we all know, once you really bring it up to the surface, it doesn't have as much power or control. Completely. And it may have valuable information for us. Oh gosh, does it ever usually? <laughs> it does it ever. So, you know, your value of work, you know, as you mentioned with this woman, you know, the value is probably defined by the value of the receiver, but you talk yeah. a lot about what is the value of the work and what it, and the value system around it. So as we're talking about this, what does that, how do you define that the value? Why do you talk about value? Well, because people, people look, when people are looking at something that they might go and do, or invest in in some way, they, they try to quantify the value of it by looking at external factors, uh, tangible factors. So they're looking at it and saying, what is the value of that? Now that, okay, it's a fair enough thing to do. You want to buy a full length black leather coat, which I did once, you know, that's a valuable piece of kit right there, right? So you want to buy an Aston Martin. That's a valuable thing, but it's only valuable because everyone agrees it's valuable. Ultimately, what's valuable to each person is the thing that meets them and meets their need. So the question is, what is my need? And what do I feel will meet that need? And that thing, regardless of its inherent or apparent value to anybody else on the planet, 
that's the thing of the greatest value for me. And that's the most important thing. So that's what I'm always inviting people to do. Judge the value of something according to whether it's a fit with your need and your desire, not according to whether it fits with any other value system that's external to you, because all of that is irrelevant and it doesn't matter. What matters is you. I love that. I love that. And I think as we are starting a new calendar year, I think thinking about what what do you value now and and what is your resistance? I think that's a great thing to think about because so many of us have been sitting at this place year after year thinking about running into something, but we we have all these internal barriers that we create for ourselves sometimes. And I think if you're at that place and you feel like you need a little push or you want to dive into those levels of resistance or even check out Pelawa, I really encourage you to reach out to Catherine because I feel like this is why I have the podcast to introduce you to people that you may not find on your own, but that come as part of my network and women that are doing amazing work to help alleviate pressures and remove some of the barriers for us to really step into the light that we are here to shine. So with that, Catherine, I love that you joined us. If there's any parting words you want to share or any details, we'll include your links below. But I'm just really grateful that you're here. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing, which is such beautiful work. I really appreciate it. It makes me happy knowing you're over there doing it. Mm, Well, I look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you for your work. And please reach out to Catherine, share the episode, or share what you're working on. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again here next time.